pronounced Swamiji. So I think man, and, uh, you're very well known in India. You've come from a long tradition of Vedanta. This is your first visit to Australia. We would be interested to know what your background is, what activities you have in India at your ashram, and what brings you to the West and in this particular instance to Australia. Mainly, we run an institution there which is working as a Hindu seminary, training young boys to understand the depth of our scripture. And they are sent out there afterwards to the various parts of India, according to their language area, and they preach and spread that idea. This is ne needed because for the last about 800 years, this philosophical part of Hinduism has been allowed to ruin, neglected. So the philosophical depth of our religion is unknown to us in the country now, while the rituals, the empty rituals, are still going on. So this I felt is the need that in 1952 we started it, and slowly started spreading the idea out. Then about 60, I think, I started this school, and batches of them go out every three years course it is, and when they are trained, they go out and start working around the, the whole country. Later on, we found that more and more boys are coming from America, and when they come there, they don't like the food, they like a lot of difficulties. So I thought that why not start one in America? So we started another one in America. One of the boys, my friend, my disciple, went there, and they trained that one batch of students. This is the main work. From place to place we go, and in open air universities, we give discourses upon the Gita, and in the morning class time for limited people, the Upanishads, and try to explain it to them in terms of or with accent to modern scientific developments that are taking place now. <clears throat> in order to give them some field for service and social, social service and become conscious of their duties towards the society, we have started uh, schools, some 42 high schools are running, some nine colleges, hospitals, dispensaries, uh, uh, diagnostic centers and that sort of activities so that these members of our organization can go there and work and learn that art. Swami, you obviously think that Hinduism has something to say to people in the West. You've spoken just now of having a center in America right. and I think you're planning to establish a center here right. in Australia. Right. Yeah. Uh, what are the problems, as you see them, of translating Hindu philosophy for people like us in the West? Can we really understand it, or is our culture so foreign that it right. is impossible for us? Right. Now, it is only a geographical concept that you are West and we are East. Sheer geographical. Or the color of the skin. The urges of the human mind, the needs and the demands, is universally the same. Everybody wants happiness. Even though we are wanting happiness, all our activities are to gain pleasure. Pleasure is not happiness. And therefore, what will you make it in life? You are disappointed. What you demanded was not gained. It's something like an infant child wanting milk and screaming. The poor thing doesn't know. Then its tongue goes somewhere near the lips. The poor thing thinks that this is the nipple that's coming, and it starts sucking the tongue. After some time, there is quietude, but then it starts disappointed because no milk is coming, and therefore it starts screaming again. I think that is why the Americans call it as make, made a sucker of you, <laughs> sucking the tongue. <laughs> Similarly, we sweat and toil in order to gain more money so that we may purchase this, that, that. What they give you is only pleasure, but what we are demanding is happiness. This is there all over the world. But I hope... So if Vedanta is given to them, 
They understand that Vedanta doesn't mean that you must give up your religion and come there. Pursue the religion, but you must know what are the steps. Why I am taking these steps? With that understanding when you go, it is more effective. So, so you see <laughs> Vedanta as a kind of basis for all religions? All religions. Mm -hmm. All religions are based on these fundamentals. All. The fundamentals upon which all religions are based are all collected together. That is Vedanta. Mm -hmm. But historically, it being earlier, we'll have to say that mm -hmm. Vedanta is the basis upon which all religions stand. And if there is a religion which is contradicted to these fundamentals, it is not a religion. It is only an apparent look of a religion. I was going to ask the Swami whether you have in fact many Western followers who do integrate Hinduism with the practice of a religion which they had before they came to you. Now, yes, there are very many. They are still Christians. They, are not, they have not even asked me to take them into Hinduism. And even if anybody has asked, I have already told them that we have got enough number there, we don't want number. You remain in your... Because your religion also can take you there. But only with a little understanding. That orientation Vedanta gives. So there are very many, especially Jews, Christians, where we have got our centers there in the Middle East also. Mm. There are very many Arabs also. But still they are Muslims. They must study there because that is where they are born. From childhood onwards it was there. Mm -hmm. It is easier for them to appreciate it. So they need not change their religion, but understand that the fundamental, it is all one. It's different ways of reaching the same goal. And the emphasis may be different, mm -hmm. but the path is the same. So they are all pursuing it. And, uh, there's definitely a large number, not a small number, a large number of them are following very sincerely. So it is some people who say that Hinduism is a religion that grew within the social structure of India and therefore it support, supports a particular type of social structure, for example the caste system and uh, certain other uh, systems which make for a, a particular lifestyle, a particular form of life, such that it may not be adaptable too easily outside India. Now, religion has got two aspects. One is the pure philosophical depth religion, and the other is the superficial, the ritualistic, the social discipline. The social discipline aspect of religion will be always reflecting the social conditions where it was born. For example, in Islam, there at that time, the four tribes were fighting with each other. To integrate them was the main idea. They were fighting among themselves because of the idols that the Greeks had left there. So then naturally the emphasis was no idol worship, take the thing away. So that they call it their, their uh, mutual fighting is ended. Then they get to together. So then what I meant was there will be this concept of the reflection of the social conditions of the time in the superficial behavior of the religion, the ritualistic aspect. But the depth of philosophy in it will be universally applicable. You are emphasizing philosophy, Swamiji, and yet some critics would say that uh, for the average Hindu, the philosophical preoccupations are of very little relevance. They, their religion is more to do with precisely rituals, the rites, sacrifices to the gods to get boons for themselves, and the media is more the mythologies rather than the scriptures and the philosophical things. Hence, they may even go on to argue, as some people do, that the philosophical thing was imposed on these people by a particular class of people who had an interest to rule the society in a particular way. When and I've got a headache, I take an aspirin. I need not know what is this composition. But a few university students will have to know it because they are studying for the particular science of it. Mm. Is it? In the same way, philosophy everybody need not study, cannot study. You see? But those who are studying it, they must continuously study in depth. To the average man, the millions in the world, the ritual, the church, the mosque, the temple, and go there, and for the time being mentally quieten yourself. 
and have got a faith that there is a forgiving, all forgiving, uh, infinite Lord whose grace will be with me is more than sufficient. Philosophy is studied only those who have got questions in the intellect. How, why, when? Then to them to satisfy them, the philosophy is given. It's not everybody who has got it. So that, that idea is not there. You also mentioned in between of the caste system. <laughs> Casteism is the pervert, uh, what is it, uh, um, in, um, evil in our society today. But caste, you can't remove it. Ay -ay -ay. It is a scientific classification of human personality. There are Brahmins here in Australia. There are Chhatriyas, dynamic men of action, the politician in this country. Are there not commercial people here? The Vaishyas? Are they not Miyar Brahman? Are they not good people here? You have to be whipped in order to get work out of them? Which part of the world is not there? These are the four names, and in the original name, when you say, you immediately think of the, the de decadent confusions in India, but translated in English. Are there not brain trust in every part of the country? The Brahmin? Uncompromisingly living their own convictions? Are there not dynamic men who want to bring those ideals into society and working? The leader class? The commercial? And the workers? Huh? So you see the caste says psychological types. Types. Yes. Psychological classification of the human minds. These are there all over the world. A caste some. Later on, what happened in India was, in the second century, first century, they started eugenics. They started a human breeding experiment. Just as we breed today horses and dogs, where we are very particular that the breed must be the same breed, so that we may get good pups. They were anxious that they to good human beings, geniuses. So they, in order to do that, they selfed. That is the first term. The word, technical term in agriculture, selfie. So the Brahmin should marry only in Brahmin. Thus their qualities are brought out. This experiment was done in the first century. And true enough, we had a harvest of geniuses in the second century. Astrology, astronomy, medicine, mathematics. All these rose up at that time. But they continued. There was no other creative master to say that, stop it. Mm -hmm. They continued. Therefore, it has become more and more uh, mutant. They, 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 what do you call that technical term? I forget now. That after so, some time, the seeds become very weakened, weakened. Yes. So today, the Brahmin class has become weakened mm -hmm. because of this inbreeding. Mm -hmm. See, the Parsis have become inbreeding, that sort of way has happened. So then what uh, the situation was, I mean, the thing was that this uh, was an experiment in town. Slowly, the Brahmin class and the Kshatriyas together became the power politics in India. So the Brahmin started keeping away all the other part of the parties or other castes away from the scriptural study, etc. So you see present-day castes as a degenerate form of it the... Very degenerate form. But we can remove the caste sum. That is why the, that word I used. The caste sum. We can remove. But caste you cannot remove. Caste is not... Uh, who translated Varna into caste? Yes. He is, I don't know, he must be congratulated. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Because today we have got casting. Mm. A part of the machine, you cast. So first you make a cast in clay, and then you pour the metal into it. Then you get the same design. Mold. Similarly, there are four molds for human minds. Cast. And they become those who have got highly intellectual pursuits. And there are the others who are, uh, what do you call that, uh, dynamic men of action wanting to serve the society, etc. There are others who have got always an eye on the profit. And there are others. If you can't take work out of me, take. But give me food. <laughs> give, let me rest. That's sort of everywhere in the world. Even in your family we can find one son is a Brahminical type, the other is a 
in the same blood, the same family. So it is a human um, classification. And therefore, don't say that casteism is reflected in it. No. Yes. No, it's not so much the caste system, I think, as much as the, the jati system. The jati is a sort of a sub-caste system which proliferated in India, and so much so that we have within the same Varna many even different jatis. Even in the best of things, when it is in society for some time, it becomes worst of things. Human man, man when he contacts, he perverts everything for his own selfish ends. This is in nature. So there's such a beautiful thing as the caste system has deteriorated. You are telling me the story of his decay. <laughs> yes. So we are planning to have a revival of it. Huh? And this jadi and all that is gone now in India. You are talking from some books. From library you may talk. It but is in India it is gone. Because you know the economic uh, mm. development and everybody is fully engaged in it. There is no time for it. Swami, that leads to a question that came to my mind listening to you. The impact of Western technological culture yes. in India yes. is as great as in other countries. Yes. I wonder whether um, the caste system that Purushottama mentioned and that you've discussed would also have been affected by the impact of technology, Western ways of living and Western ways of organizing industry so that the kind of Hinduism you are now teaching, a more philosophical approach, not only has to correct simple-minded country people, it has to also correct perhaps a changed Indian culture? Mm, you're right. This technological shock has shocked all cultures. Chinese culture is wiped out. And there are only Chinese and the Indian culture that is still living in the ancient time. And to an extent it has colored the Indian philosophy, Indian culture also. So that perhaps you are reviving Indian culture to some extent by... No, at the same time upgrading it yes. to the modern times. It has to. Every culture has to. And you feel that Hinduism, in this purified form that you teach, can upgrade a modern, degenerate Indian I think culture? So. No, I can't pursue, and I'm not uh, forecasting, but uh, I think that these are the situations in which, without compromising the philosophical conclusions arrived at in the past, mm. it has to. Now, really speaking, the New Testament, what is new in it? Old Testament upgraded mm. to a certain need of the society. Is it not? This is very clear in the Indian history. Our culture, the Bharatiya culture, the Indian culture tradition was the ancient. It saw, she saw rather, the Greek culture rising, coming to eminence. She applauded it and then she was sad when it was decaying and it was, we presided over complete annihilation. Roman culture rose up, did die away. Egyptian culture rose up, died away. Macedonian culture rose up, died away. All these we witnessed. But the Hindu culture is even today, we are discussing now, because it is not a historical labor in the library only, but it is dynamically living. Now, what is the secret of it? I am answering your question. Yes, what is the secret of it? Nothing in the world can be permanent. So a culture also must decay. Our culture also many times decayed. But every time they all thought that Hinduism is dead, she got up at the burial ground and said, where have you brought me? What is the matter with you? She revived. Mm. Each time when we thought that it died, it revived. Somehow or other there is that intrinsic vitality in this culture that at the last lingering moments, a great master or a great uh, uh, when a, a great leader is thrown up, mm. who uplifts it. Thus the Vedic culture was dying, Vyasa was thrown up. The Pauranic culture came. The Pauranic culture also decaying, great Hindu rose in revolt against it, called Buddha. Buddhism maintained for some time, by the 7th century Buddhism also decayed, split into small, small groups. Great Shankaracharya came. Shankara's answer also is not permanent. 8th century Shankara revived, 11th century Ramanuja had to come. 15th century Madhva had to come. 19th century British, British rule. People lost their self-confidence. They will not do anything. 
the great Vivekananda came and revived him. So our culture is maintained even today only because of its own intrinsic vitality through the right type of person at that crucial moment who could answer the weaknesses of that time, correct it, and give it a new push, new life. So, so, so. Mm. Swami, one of the essential features of Western culture has been its rationalism right from the time of the Greeks and I suppose with the development of science and technology from the 17th century onwards, once again, our culture has been much more rationalistic than other cultures. We've tended to think that unless we can work everything out by reason, then it's not there. Now, I take it that you're, um, you see in Vedanta some way of transcending this fixation on rationalism. Do you think in Western culture we've forgotten what you might call very loosely the mystical tradition, the mystical dimension? Uh, when I am doing agriculture, let us say, first the flower comes out. Then I watch for a few days or a week or two or ten days, the flower perishes, then the fruit emerges. Watching what is happening in my garden, if my neighbor also starts, and the flower came, and he said, why waste ten days? The flower has come. Now the flower takes ten days before the fruit can come. So he plucks the flower and throws it away. Do you think that any fruit will come out of it? <laughs> the flower must come. The flower must open up. The opening of the flower is not its fulfillment. The fruit must emerge out of it. Rational, intelligent thinking is necessary. In Vedanta, logic, the Nyaya and Tarka, it's a hair splitting, I tell you. And without that a subtle intellect, you cannot understand Vedanta also. But then Vedanta never stops there where the British or my Western countries stop. Mere rationalism, mere rationalism. We understood the limitations of the intellect. So intellectually to come to a conclusion, rational thinking is necessary. Rationalism has got a place. But then after all, even rationally when you conclude, it is only a thought. Who is the knower of the thought? What gives its vitality? It is the awareness and consciousness of subject. I conclude, isn't it? You conclude that there is no God, and therefore you say, I am an atheist. Mm -hmm. He concludes that there is a God, and therefore he says he is a theist. But both these are conclusions of the intellect. Mm -hmm. Who came to know of it? Okay. So, Anya Deva Tadvididadhi, just now we are taking, can open it. It is something, this great reality is something other than what you know, and something more than what you don't know. To know and not know are the intellectual concepts, conditions. Who is awareing this? I know what I know, and I also know what I don't know. Then who is this I? It can be this known and the unknown. They are the objects of my awareness. This awareness must be me. Thus we go beyond. Therefore everybody thinks that no, it is not rational. <laughs> Without rational thinking you cannot come to that point. We must live through the intellect, through the zenith of the intellect. And then must have the heroism to go beyond the intellect. That they don't. And this is what you are teaching your trying young boys to, and spreading... To, exactly, mysticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's through intellect. Because, you know, if you just merely talk mysticism, they will not understand. Through intellect, satisfy all your questions. How, why, when, what, where, who. Even after all these, what is the conclusion arrived at? Is only an intellectual uh, appreciation. Mm -hmm. No, it must be a spiritual apprehension. So we push them towards it. And you think it's possible to discover some kind of basis for unity, say, between the tradition of Christian mysticism and uh, Hindu mysticism? Now look, at the mysticism level there is no quarrel. All are one. It's as if somebody, everybody copied from the other. Honestly, even phraseology is the same. Now even your description of God or the highest reality, it is timeless, it is birthless. It is deathless, immortal, eternal, 
immutable, changeless. These are the same words in all the... Quran also says the same. Mm. Christianity also says. You see, it is only in the lower level that the distinctions. The church is not like the mosque. Mosque is not like the temple. Mm. The puja with he is different. The dress is different. What you offer to the Lord is different. But that is because of the climatic conditions, etc. On these unnecessarily power politics, I tell you, that is nothing but, it is not religion that is quarreling. Religion with politics quarrels. Mm. And perhaps it always will. Uh, exactly. <laughs> they, they are mutually um, allergic to each other. Mm. When religion and uh, politics come together, religion also spoils, uh, politics also spoils. Look at Iran. Is that politics? Religion spoiled it. Well, you also when you were talking about revival going on in India of traditions. Would you would you say revival, or would you also talk about say progressive evolution of a tradition? In other words, no, no evolution possible. We so have reached. What's the in zenith. the beginning is also in the end. Yes, we have zenith as a reach, as a Vedantic vision. We have reached the Brahman, the reality beyond which there is nothing. We reached there in Vedanta, though. Now, uh, somebody might say that the whole Vedic tradition is an interlude, they say, between what was the early, the proto-Hinduism, which was, which was in the Indus Valley civilization, and then the later Hinduism, which arose with bhakti and so forth. It, it has nothing to do with this, what we are talking. Bhakti is only one of the new ways of approaching the in antakarna shuddhi or the inner purity. Prepare you for contemplation. After the contemplation, when you are contemplating, whether it is Krishna or Shiva, the pure state is the same. Even in Puranas. Sri Krishna Paramatmane Namaha. Sri Krishna is nothing other than that Paramatman, that supreme state. And it is being conceived in the form so that the mind may fix itself up. So that there is all means. Means are being evolved, right? But do you think there are any changes possible in Vedanta due to, say, the, um, the advent of modern science and Christianity? There's been a lot of rethinking, I suppose, of Christianity because of the advent of science. Right. Christianity has to, because Christianity, unfortunately, stood against the science. In India, we never stood against science. We said this is para. And that is upper knowledge. This is lower knowledge. This is up higher knowledge. And we applauded the lower knowledge people. Continue. What you say the scientists who say, no, it's really the upper knowledge, the science is the only sort of knowledge. Lots of scientists they, they say that. Call, they call that. But uh, then when it, it came to now sub-nuclear and sub-atomic science, <laughs> the physiol I mean, the metaphysics and physics are merging together. Mm, there is a kind of mysticism of physics today. Exactly, it's exactly what I'm saying. Mm. Because the, that marginal line, they can't understand. Whether it is spirit or energy or matter, they can't say. Mm. All of them are merging into one. Mm. I mean, wait another 20 years, you can afford to. You are young. <laughs> <laughs> I will quit. <laughs> In another 20 years time, I'm sure, that the entire attitude will be changing. Many of the higher physicists have changed their attitude. Right? Yes. Huh. So then the great Vedic period also, I think, that they searched first outside the reality and found that it is all pointing towards him. And then therefore they left that. Those who want to play with it, play. They entered into a higher state of searching the spring of all consciousness within themselves. When they reach there, they say that they are all satisfied, all questions are solved. Mm. There is nothing to question about because there is only one infinite self. One of the complaints that Westerners make about Eastern religions in general, not just about Hinduism, but say about Buddhism, is that they're not really concerned with improving man's social lot, that they're not concerned with social justice. Right. Is that true, do you think? It is true in the sense that we don't strut about saying that we are going to save mankind and bring about every 25 years a total world war for peace. Mm -hmm. We believe that if man individually can reduce his ego and selfishness a little, social order automatically comes. Even today, what is the social difficulties? Our selfishness only. Countries have got selfishness, communities have got selfishness, isn't it? 
from uh, the trouble that is coming up now here. Asia, Asia, go, go back, Asians, go back. Why? The selfishness that uh, we are not getting that much of a job, we would have got more job. You understand? Uh, stand apart, I am not politician. Mm -hmm. Stand apart, I am just giving you a vivid example. So too everywhere, the rich doesn't want to share it with others. The poor one doesn't want to work, but want to get a share of the rich. I mean, everywhere, selfishness comes, even in your family. Mm. If the man is more selfish than the woman, they are to depart, part each other. Would you claim, Swami, that Hinduism is better equipped to handle this universal problem than other religions? Um, I wouldn't say that. It seems to be a universal problem, doesn't I it? Wouldn't, yes, I wouldn't say that. Every religion is capable of that. Ha. But to the modern youngster, the appeal of the Vedanta would be much more strong. Mm. Why? For the last about four or five generations, we have been massaging the head of everybody at the expense of the heart, isn't it? Humane qualities, where do we teach? In your university, which is the class where the humane qualities are displayed? Never! It's all rational, rational, rational. And when you are purely intellectual and no emotional beauty in you, according to Shakespeare, he is a villain. <laughs> Bolingbroke, Richard II. Bolingbroke is the villain in that po poem only because he is purely intellectual. He says no about about. Cassius too. He yeah, Cassius also. Says men in ah, so there you are. So I am not exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so they said, no, if man has fully developed, and the gallant art of giving up a little of the animal selfishness. Mm. In the animal level it is a glory, because of self self-preservation. But having become a rational human being, you have no duty to preserve yourself. How does a Western student then begin to get to grips with Vedanta? So, one thing is that we first ask him a few daring questions. What is life? Why are you here? What have you done for yourself all these years? You are 30, 35. What did you do for yourself? You earned a little money. For whom? For the wife and children. You built a building. For whom? For your wife and children. What have you done for yourself? He's shocked. By Jove, I never thought of that. <laughs> you know, help him within his own selfishness. Slowly, slowly make him understand. Then what can we do now? What is it that we can do for ourselves in life? Don't tell me that you earned a lot of money. That is for the banks. You get only a bank book. But the money is used to by the bank. That is not for you. What is it that you have done? What is your contribution? Not I am talking to society, to yourself. You eat and uh, uh, spoil to good food. Is that what you have done? Then they become shocked. And what is it that we can do? You understand? Mm -hmm. So how can you master yourself? And through that self-mastery, how can you master the environments and situations that come around, around and about? At this moment, you are an Ottoman. If everybody is rocking and rolling, you also rock and roll. You can't neither come out of it. And everybody is taking drugs, you have to take drugs, full stop. You are not yourself, you have no individuality. You don't think for yourself. You don't carve your own life. You dress as everybody else is dressing. You eat because everybody is eating. You drink because everybody is drinking. Where is your life gone? When well, these positive but the naked questions are asked, they become really upset. Mm -hmm. Then we start slowly. By a chart, we try to explain the fundamentals as quickly as possible to communicate. Because, you know, the old method of studying is about, takes about four years. The, the elementary things, elementary, the categories, all right, of the science. Then applying it, you have to go into the science. It takes that, which have now we have reduced it to four days talks, four talks. About one and a half hours a day, four talks, and through the help of a chart and all that. So they get a, a grasp of their own inner working of their personality. How, what are the weaknesses of it, why the weaknesses are there, and how am I to get out of those weaknesses? They get the idea of it. How important is the study of the scriptures in this? Oh, the scripture alone is the only mm, authority. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they did not accept me. I may be bluffing. 
Nobody has got the right to say anything about it. It has been all said in the scriptures, which has been again and again confirmed by various masters with their experiences. So those very scripture we teach, and from there we evolve and explain to them how the, and its application today in life, which they may not be able to immediately, that we will try to apply, I mean, give it to them. There you are. The scriptures, Swami as you said the other day, also say that the Hindu god is Achalam, immovable, you can't move. How are we going to move the Hindu god to the west? <laughs> uh, that was just a side comment. But um, what, uh, where would you place, say, Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi and Sri Aurobindo in the context of modern Hinduism? Both of them were great seekers. One sought it uh, in society and the other sought it in uh, return. Both are seekers, great seekers. And we appreciate them more because they have been useful to the society. They had a relevance to their age. So the other seekers who are seeking there in the Himalayan valleys are ignored by us because we don't know what they did. These people did it, and therefore we say that they are great. But they are all seekers. They are on the path. Uh, Mahatma, a sadhu, from Uttarakashi, that is one part of the Himalayas, he went uh, there to Mahatma Gandhi in Dehradun, and early in the afternoon, he was sitting and doing the uh, spinning. spinning. Yes, sure. So at that time he got the interview, so he went there. He went there and with that excitement, he said, he's a pretty old man. He said, Maharaj, I mean Gandhi, now you have done enough to society, now why don't you come to the Himalayas? So he said, yes, but in the Himalayas, what did I do? So he said, seek there the peace that passeth all understanding. You know, the peace. You live peacefully there. You have done your share. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, as he is doing, he has not stopped it. You are still doing this. <laughs> Swamiji, you are seeking peace in the Himalayas. Gandhiji is seeking peace in peacelessness, <laughs> in struggle, in the world. Ashanti means shanti, dundra. See, Ashanti means where there is uh, conflict. There I want to discover peace and not peace in the peaceful realm. He explained, I mean, that shows that the, the, he is still seeking at that time also. Huh? Only thing is, some seek it in the world while serving the society, karma yogi. Others will be withdrawing and philosophical study and contemplation, meditation, and he who doesn't want to meet anybody and quietly and undisturbed, he did that, Arvindu. So all these are seekers only. Gandhiji confessed that he had not read the scriptures. Well, not many. He read some of the Puranas, but not the Vedas and so forth. So in light of that, would you say that he compromised Hinduism because he wanted to have Hinduism adopt to a modernizing India? Or would, would he have kept quite close now, to the Now, when you say that he's studying the scriptures, scripture is not Veda. The Upanishads portions are called the scriptures of India. Upanishads and the Gita and the Brahma Sutra, these are the three main scriptures of India. Vedanta. Vedanta. For three main books. Of which Gita he has been studying. Gita is the essence of all the Upanishads. So you can't say that he has not studied the scriptures. What are you talking? He says it. I, he says it in the because he has not then the orthodox method, gone to the university of uh, specializing, university in the Himalayas, uh, specializing it. He did not do it. But the Gita, he has written a commentary also. And there's certain portions he has said that I don't understand it. Okay. Because he has not gone to the original textbook. So that I don't think that that is much of a... But what's happened to Gandhiji in India in the modern day? He seems to be forgotten. <laughs> Nobody is remembered. Now what has happened? Yes. Stalin was at happened. Hitler, I can't even pronounce the word in Germany. They will munch my nose flat. Punch my nose flat, is it? And this is all great men. Whether good or bad, in direct time they must have done. But so, much for those.
So one last question, Swamiji. If suppose India suddenly became communist or something and decided like China to get rid of religion, would you think the, would you think Hinduism would still survive? What is their definition of religion? Church, mosque, or the temple, and their rituals. Isn't it? Yes. All these will go away. Still the Vedanta will stay. <laughs> So it's not uh, geographically. Never, no. never. The Islam came and uh, broke all the idols, isn't it? About 400 years they have been breaking idols. Only their muscles developed. <laughs> Our religion did not break. This is only a symbol. So long as the philosophy remains. So long as the first mantra or the, or the Isha was open, it remains. Philosophy is in the country, it will come up. Thank you very much. Thank you.